Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm the CEO and co-founder with Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we've built some of the best in class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration and communication tools for life science companies. We uh, literally have helped companies over the last 12 years across the globe virtualize their advisory board meetings, investigator meetings, medical education, corporate events, and all kinds of other things in between. But more importantly, we really believe at Impetus, everything starts with a conversation. And through these big, hairy, audacious conversations with some of the more provocateurs, the leading edge thinkers, the digital entrepreneurs, the people that we have at the table like we do today, we can all work to collectively and positively disrupt healthcare. And so I'm super pleased to have somebody who is in that category. This is Dr. Mark Posnanski. And he actually received his PhD in physiology from McGill University. So he's a fellow Canadian. And he did a postdoctorate in biophysics at Harvard Medical School. So interesting and fascinating combination. He is one of Canada's leading scientific thinkers. And among many other roles, he's also served as the president and CEO of Ontario Genomics and the president and CEO and scientific director of the Robarts Research Institute. He's been awarded the Order of Canada, the Order of Ontario, and a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Ontario Life Sciences. He's an in-demand speaker on topics such as personalized medicine, climate change, the future of agriculture, and synthetic biology. He's contributed over 100 publications, and he holds numerous scientific patents. He's also a founder of Saved by Science. It's a website that features all kinds of blogs about scientific discoveries um, that are going on in the planet. And he also published a book, which he was really kind enough. Sorry, mine's kind of getting not captured here in the, uh, let's see here. Sorry, my virtual background. Sent me his wonderful book with the same title, Saved by Science. So welcome, Mark. It is so wonderful to have you on the show today. Delighted to be here. Lovely. So what a fascinating journey. Um, lots of interesting areas that you've been in. Maybe you can kind of paint this, the picture for the audience listening today. Um, really what sparked your interest in, you know, and how you landed where you are today and specifically your interest in leveraging science as a tool to solve a lot of these really big, hard, complex problems in the world today. Sure. So it, the book actually, and my transformation of my of my career from being a, uh, a scientist to being a communicator uh, started around, well, sort of many years ago, but a couple of years ago, I was being honored by a group called Let's Talk Science, which is a group that specializes in getting kids to be interested in science. And I was delighted to work for them, with them for many years. But all of a sudden I found myself in front of a bunch of their donors and I was talking science to them and I realized that the vast majority of them didn't have a clue what I was talking about. And I realized that it's not enough to get our kids interested in science. We have to get our, our leaders, our corporate, financial, political leaders to understand something about science if we're gonna succeed. So that's, that, that was the impetus for starting to be a communicator in this area. Absolutely and, love it. On top of that, there are two thinkers that I, I follow a lot. One is Thomas Friedman, and who talks about uh, living in an age of acceleration and how, just how quickly things are going. But we can get onto that in a little bit when we talk about the, uh, the mRNA vaccines, which have uh, been developed and are in people's arms in, in, in six or seven months, as opposed to the many years that it used to take. And then Steve Jobs, before he died, is quoted as saying that he believed that the 21st century will belong to the intersection of biology and technology. Uh, a, a new generation is being established. And I believe that in spades. And synthetic biology really is the culmination of that convergence between biology and technology. I love it. And again, I think the skill and the brilliance is in the ability for people like yourself to take the really super complex, the mathematical modeling, the stuff that nobody understands and wants to shoo away and make it so easy that the average <coughs> consumer today, 
And you see this really in what's happening in the news media outlets today, as you see the news media trying to explain the mechanisms of actions of these vaccines and the positioning and the messaging, what's making them different. But I wanna linger for a few minutes on the other key thinker that you've really been following. And you've mentioned this several times in your book, which is Thomas Friedman's book, Thank You for Being Late, An Optimist Guide to Thriving in the Age of Accelerations. So you actually had a whole chapter on this book, um, you know, quoting other people and the idea of being in the era of acceleration. Maybe you can describe to the audience what exactly we mean by this age of accelerations. Well, it, it, it simply means that, <clears throat> sorry, that things are going quickly. But let me just give you examples from technology and as well as from biology. So think about uh, a computer from 1990, okay? And we would talk about bytes, okay? Today, we're talking about petabytes. That's a thousand trillion more information than when we were talking about just 20 years ago. When we talk about speeds of computers, we're talking about a uh, hundred million times faster today than 20 years ago. So everything is being accelerated. And when we thought, think about genomics, when the human genome was established little less than 20 years ago, when the project was established, it cost $2 billion and took two years. We can take that same thing today, rather than causing two, costing $2 billion, it'll cost $200. And instead of taking 20 years, it can take just minutes. So that's the type of acceleration we're undergoing today. And it's a result of scientific developments, population growth, all of those different things that are happening more rapidly. So it's tremendously exciting, but not a little bit scary as well. So we might as well jump right into this whole thing around vaccines and the way they're being developed and the traditional trajectory that the de development and innovation schema or life cycle has traditionally happened in our healthcare system, where it's taken years and decades and research and certain dollar funds and the mechanisms in which the research was being done. And then suddenly we reached this global pandemic with this global need and suddenly we were hit with this concept of acceleration. Everything was thrown at it. The people, the money, the research, the technologies in which to invent this. So maybe we can sink our teeth a little bit into what you saw is what enabled a vaccine that would have taken decades to create to really have been created within less than a year. Well, you know, traditionally you had little bits of virus or little bits of bacteria and you inactivated them so they weren't dangerous and uh, you injected them into some subjects or some patients and you hoped that those subjects or patients would develop antibodies and make the uh, individual immune from subsequent uh, uh, in infection. And that was the way vaccines were made for for the past 200 years. They became a little bit more sophisticated, but not much more sophisticated. That's why when we started working on the vaccine for COVID-19, we talked about, well, maybe we would have a vaccine in four years, but we weren't sure, okay? The modern vaccines for COVID-19 don't use that piece of biological material. They, meet, they use an instruction, and that's messenger RNA. And you actually, all you do is you give the patient that instruction and the patient makes the vaccine themselves effectively. Okay. So the whole, and, 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 and making the vaccine, you make it in, the, in, a, in a chemistry laboratory coming off of a computer as opposed to a big complicated biology laboratory. So it could be done very quickly. Uh, because it's not a dead vaccine, a dead virus that you're given, just, just a little bit of mRNA, you would assume that the safety is going to be very, very high. And that's exactly what happened. And now the Americans and, and the Brits, are, Pfizer and Moderna, are talking, but the next time we have a virus like the COVID-19 virus, we're going to be able to make the vaccine in, 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 in a period of weeks rather than rather than many months. That's fascinating. Eventually it can be even shorter than that. 
So this is really not the start, but an example of synthetic biology. So this is a whole other scientific phenomena that we've been dabbling in for many, many decades, but I think suddenly it's flourishing and I think it's become a more common part of our discourse in you know, regular circles. Can you actually spend a couple of minutes describing what do we mean by synthetic biology? What's the concept behind it? And why do you believe that you think this could actually be used to save the planet somehow? Okay, so synthetic biology is simply the engineering of new novel biological entities. I'm gonna stop right there. Okay, now I want I need to give you a short lesson in microbiology. And it's a, it's a it's about a, a 90 second lesson. Okay. First of all, when we think about my, microbes, uh, they're, they're these tiny single cell organisms, and you could put thousands upon thousands on the tip of a needle. More than 50% of the Earth's biomass, all the biological material, are in fact microbes. The microbes have been around on Earth for about three to four billion years. Modern man has been on Earth for about 300,000 years. And modern man and microbes share a tremendous amount of biological or genetic material. So if you think about it, microbes have suffered exactly the same insults that man has in terms of cold and hot and fear and drought and heat uh, and et, et cetera. But microbes have evolved over a period of three or four billion years to adapt to those conditions and man hasn't. So let me give you a, a couple of, uh, one concrete example. There are microbes that are seen to grow in ice. We now know by dissecting that, mi that microbe and understanding its genomics, we now know the specific gene that allows that microbe to, gr to grow on in ice. What if we could take that same gene and introduce it into the potato plant or into the strawberry plant to allow those plants to grow under slightly colder conditions? That's synthetic biology. That's so well put. And, um... And we're, you know, the exploration of this is fascinating, but I do think we need to double click on what is happening in the world today and not, not putting a negative spin, but a certain level of, 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 you know, capturing what's happening in people's reality is everybody has a different version of the truth. This has actually become very evident <laughs> with a lot of things that are going down south of the border of us and, you know, and globally with the social unrest, the economic upheaval, uh, the the uh, the health situation that we're in, and you know the political situation that's going on across the globe. So we realize that people interpret inf information in completely different ways, including the truth behind science. So when we have these great new scientific opportunities, there's oftentimes the naysayers who actually even disbelieve the scientific facts. So for example, we, are, we may run into issues with anti-vaxxers, or we're gonna run into people with issues around you know, non-GMOs and concerns. What do you have to say as a scientist to that, that um, envelope or that cohort of people that exist, you know, Canada, the US globally, there's a cohort of people that have that level of thinking. So that's what I'm doing for a living. I'm, I'm trying to educate people to get them to understand, okay? And, 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 and if they don't, first of all, we have to understand knowledge, and you have to un understand truth. And the former president of Harvard uh, University, Derek Bach, said many years ago, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance, okay? <laughs> and, if you, and, if, and, you, and if you think about 400,000 people and counting who are now dead in the United States, okay? A lot of that is because of scientific ignorance. And we have to put a stop to that nonsense because it's ignorant, it's wrong. 
but you have to develop a certain knowledge amongst your population who will then say, hey, wait a second, you know that, that, that stuff that we learned about how bad GMOs for you are, are for you? It, it turns out that that's wrong, that that's not true, that GMOs didn't destroy the monarch butterfly or are not poisoning people. And we have to understand that the anti-vaxxers are in fact conspiracy theorists. The, 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 the effect of the, of the mumps, measles vaccine, uh, creating autism is wrong. It's not true. And more people have to understand <clears throat> and, and be able to, 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 follow, to follow that. And that's what I'm trying to do. Absolutely. So we've talked a little bit about COVID-19 and the acceleration of developing some very effective and safe vaccines. So I'm just kind of curious about your view on synthetic biology and some of these new developments, you know, nanotechnologies, CRISPR. Um, how are all of these going to impact the way we do clinical studies and the way we discover new chemicals, new entities, new uh, new treatments for people? What what says your thoughts in that area? Well, you have you, you now have a, a new body of knowledge, okay, through genomics, and you have a new body of knowledge that you have access because it's all sitting on your computer. So let's look at the area of gene therapy, and and I'll, I'll get to CRISPR in just in just a second. I mean, people actually here in Toronto uh, discovered uh, the gene for muscular dystrophy. Uh, I think it's almost fifty years ago now, and over that time. People have been trying to do gene therapy, uh, make that gene in the laboratory and somehow introduce it into the un unfortunate young person who has muscular dystrophy and a few other diseases. And it's never worked, okay? Because we didn't really know how to take the gene and insert it into the proper place at the proper time in the proper dose. Along comes a microbe discovered by some scientists in Europe and in Stanford and at, at Harvard uh, that has a gene editing system. And that gene editing system is inherent in the microbe is called CRISPR. And there are many of them now, okay? And we can now say, well, can we take that microbe's CRISPR system to be able to, uh, to, to, to introduce the defective gene into the appropriate tissue? And it looks like we're able to do it. So here's a, a perfect example of synthetic biology and the power of microbes and knowledge from microbes that is allowing to introduce a, a, a new, new types of therapy. And it's been used to treat certain eye diseases in young children. It's been used to treat uh, sickle cell anemia. And it's starting to be thought about how to use uh, be, be, for, treat, for, for cancer treatments. So tell us a little bit about how it can be used in cancer. Right now, or you know, historically, we've used these very, very strong chemicals that sort of come in and kill everything in its way, and that you're hoping that the person is healthy enough that they're able to rejuvenate and recuperate from that uh, you know, major uh, assault by these chemicals. Oh, what oh. is the promise of the new personalized way that we can use synthetic um, chemistry, if yeah. you will, for cancer management. Yeah. So I'll t I'm going to tell you another story. It goes back a little while from the National Institutes of Health in Washington, a fellow by Steve Rosenberg, and he was a cancer surgeon. And uh, when he would take out cancerous material from some of his patients, he would look at the solid masses and he would see a bunch of white blood cells. And he theorized that those white blood cells were trying to attack the cancer, but they weren't very good at it. So he said, what if I could take those white blood cells and sort of dope them up to become more effective cancer killers? And he did it and it worked. Not very well, but it worked. In fact, I think one of the previous premiers of Quebec was in fact treated at the NIH in the late nineties using that technology. Now, using synthetic biology, we can take those same white blood cells and then and make them more proficient at detecting the cancer cells and then attacking them, killing them. And that's being done now. And it's, it's also called uh, uh, immunotherapy, 
but in this case, you're actually taking the cells and uh, using synthetic biology, you're, you're doping them up or souping them up to make them more effective cancer cells. And those, those, those clinical experiments are ongoing in many different centers in, in the United States as well as in Canada. And using that same thinking, Mark, um, how can this also be applied for traditionally really chronic, insidious diseases and conditions like mental health? Now that we're emerging out of this COVID-19 pandemic, never have we seen an opportunity to employ treatments, therapies, or, or otherwise to be able to manage all of the myriad of conditions and addictions and all sorts of other things that are happening. So for example, like schizophrenia, what is happening in the, in the scientific world to help manage these kinds of conditions? Perfect, perfect question actually. And, and it's most appropriate that you say it give, it, give it to me today, because tomorrow Eric Lander is gonna be sworn in into, the, into, into Biden's cabinet. He's the director of the Broad Institute at, at Harvard, and he's been on, on the search for uh, schizophrenia genes for the past 30 years. And quite frankly, up until 10 years ago, hadn't found them. But now there are, turns out there are a whole bunch of genes that predispose individuals to uh, schizophrenia. And so once you determine which are the most important ones, you can then think about using either a CRISPR technique or an immunotherapy technique to go in and either kill those cells or modify the genes. That's still quite a ways off in schizophrenia. It's here in cancer, it's here in infectious diseases, obviously, and a few other diseases. But for, for mental illness, like addiction, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, we still don't have an, an excellent handle on the target. But when we do, we're gonna be able to go in there and interfere with the disease. We've explored obviously the invention of the COVID-19 vaccine and the miracle in which how rapidly it was able to be discovered and we're obviously going through the execution and one day we're gonna look back at this and the lessons learned. But as we think forward into the world where infectious diseases are gonna be probably become a standard way of living, we also have to be concerned potentially about, uh, you know, these kinds of things like the, the type of warfare that might be happening more from chemical warfare, those sorts of things, and how we're going to manage our health around this, other kinds of infectious diseases. How else do you feel that synthetic biology and the, you know, this kind of science is going to help with um, preventing or predicting or squashing these kinds of pandemics right from the legs, right from the get-go? How are we going to be able to do that? Well, George Church, Church at, at Harvard Medical School has a, a, a short uh, presentation that he makes about actually curing cancer at the bedside, but you can do exactly the same with an infectious disease. So picture this, the, the patient is at, in, in a doctor's office or in the, in, in the laboratory and there's a, can, there's a cancer, uh, the cancer is extracted, the cell, the genome of the cell is immediately sequenced and you de determine what the specific mutation is, okay? You know what the mutation is, then you create a virus, a synthetic virus that is able to go after all cells that have that mutation and kill them. And you've effectively killed, you've effectively cured cancer there. Uh, you might have to do repeatedly if different mutations occur. And you can do exactly the same for infectious diseases. And to a certain extent, the modern mRNA vaccine that is being, being produced is, does that just that, except it does it on a population base as opposed to an individual base. Fantastic. Yeah, just really, really informative. And I guess the, the other question around all of this as well, too, is, is you know how are we considering this idea of highly personalized medicine literally to the point of an n equals one treatment so there's a lot of famous thinkers out there everything from dr you know peter diamandis to ray kurzweil 
who's written a lot about these things like nanotechnologies or these almost these nanobots, which are little micro robots sure. that get inserted into your bloodstream and do all kinds of wild and wonderful things at an individual level. Is this science fiction, Mark, or are we on the precipice of some of these really amazing inventions? Well, I think I gave you a, a, an example just now of, of cancer, and I don't see why that can't be transformed to say somebody with, with high, blood, high blood, uncontrollable high blood pressure. So if you can go in and identify uh, uh, the, the genetic aberration that is causing that high blood pressure, you can use one of Peter Diamandis' nanobots to go in and, and, uh, and either kill it or modify it. That's, that's in fact synthetic biology. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to see what is going to be happening in that space. And, you know, I guess the other question as well, too, has to be around, do we see the discovery of these really intricate and interesting technologies changing the way we do our hypothesis generation and the whole premise around the scientific method where we did phase one and phase two and phase three, we, you know, we were focused on biological systems. Is that going to change? Um, are we going to be start, start considering usage of things like, um, you know, trials in silica and using mathematical models to accelerate some of our thinking? Where does this fit into this new world that we're, we find ourselves? So, so, so if you look at, at and let's keep with the infectious disease as aspect. So if you look at the traditional development of vaccine is you're, you're creating a, a, a strange thing in the laboratory. This is the old way of doing things. And you say, boy, you know, I might be able to make a vaccine to that, but I have to do a lot of work to make sure it's safe. Okay. Or if you find a drug against infections like, like penicillin from, a, from a, a, a moss in a field, you need a lot of work to make sure that A, it works, and B, that it's safe. Okay? Using mRNA technology, as in the COVID-19 vaccine, okay, you, 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 do, you can do it once establishing the safety, establishing that it works, and then tweak it a little bit against other, other infections. And that will shorten the, the, the clinical, tr clinical trial period. And it might be that at some point you can either say you don't even have to do any clinical trials because we know it's gonna be safe. It's never caused a problem before. And then you can actually do N of one experiments. It's, it really is an exciting time to see all of these changes. And again, we can leverage. I mean, I, I know people are very hesitant to talk about the silver lining behind COVID-19 because it is a very serious time. It's a very troubling time and there's a lot of loss. But if there's anything, there's been a, a, a groundswell of energy and momentum around these big pivotal changes, especially around technology. Well, and so I, it does make one, sorry, what were you going to say, Mark? I, I was going to say that my wife knows that I, I, I shout at the TV a lot these days. I said, <laughs> he said, he said science, he said science, he said science, you know. That's it's never great. before, right? It was never yeah. on the list of the average consumer, but now it is. And people are, you know, talking about mechanisms of action. And it's really, a, really pretty sobering to see that. But, you know, it, we would be remiss not to sort of move into where science is actually starting to infiltrate in so many other aspects and they're all interrelated, right? So the idea around climate, you know, we've seen horrendous things like global warming that's happening. And we've seen the effects of this just this past year with some of these, you know, in, you know, uh, the fires that were happening out West and, you know, the air quality and the impact on air quality. So tell us a little bit about what you presume or predict is going to be the role of science and technology in addressing global warming and the impact of climate change to all of us. So, uh, so, so I blog every week and, and my, my, my blog last week uh, had to do with food and my blog this week's, week has to do with climate. And the fact of the matter is if, 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 if I think about what worries me, uh, the issues of the security of, of our food supply and the issues of climate change, global warming, to my mind are actually much more serious. 
than, than, than human health. I mean, human health hits, uh, hits each of us, but really the, the bigger issues are, are the security of our food supply and, 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 and climate change. And, and, uh, and Thomas Friedman talks a lot about that in the age of acceleration. You know, there are just too many people on the planet. You know, I joke with my friends who want uh, to eat organic, and I say, well, I think I think the whole world should be should should go organic. The only problem is we'd have to get rid of about four or five billion people because there wouldn't be enough food to feed them. Uh, you know, I joke also with my vegan and vegetarian friends uh, who 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 want to have nothing to do with meat, and yet the world is dying for meat protein. And we're talking about you know billions and billions of people. Now here, uh, synthetic biology can have an enormous impact, okay? Uh, first of all, there, there are a huge problem with agriculture. Can you make enough food? And agriculture uses more than 30% of the world's energy. And we're deforesting all, all parts of the earth. That causes an increase in greenhouse gases and more global warming. Uh, and so I think the future of food is going to be entirely different from what it is today. And I think most foods will actually, within 30 or 40 years, be made in lab laboratories in large vats. And they'll look real. I mean, the Israelis are making a steak right now from cultured meat cells uh, that they use a digital printer to make it look uh, and eventually taste like a prime rib. Uh, there's a, a company called Perfect Day in California that's uh, making an ice cream that is made from milk proteins that are made in yeast as opposed to in, in cows. So those are two very specific areas where we're going to use synthetic biology uh, to al alter agriculture in a major, major way. So this is very interesting because we have seen in very small doses the change in the way we eat even recently since the pandemic. And what I mean by very small change is we're used to going out and making, you know, these lavish dinners and having people over, going out to restaurants. And even that generalized paradigm has shifted, right? So we're already making a change in how we look at food or how we're consuming food and who we're consuming it with. Now we're actually talking about something much bigger, which is even that's kind of the how we're eating, but the what is the big question. So what we really wanna have a, a bit of an understanding around some of these genetically modified foods and what are we looking at? And, and can you describe some of them as, a, like, I know you've mentioned some of the things like the super meats, but you know we're hearing about things like milk without cows and other genetically modified foods. Um, what's on the precipice and are people who are afraid of this validated in their fears? So wait a minute. Today, if we could be on on, on the what, what's the waterfront area in San Francisco? Uh, um, the uh, Embarcadero or the yeah uh, yeah you could actually go in and buy an ice cream cone, okay, where all of the milk proteins are made in large vats of yeast. They don't come from cows. You can buy milk as well. And so that, that to me is the future. And I, I mean, I, I hope all the people in the dairy industry aren't gonna come after me. They probably will, but that's okay. Uh, so so that, that, to me, that is, is the future, okay? Now, but synthetic biology can do some other things. So if you think about what, what are we gonna eat when we go to Mars? And we're not gonna bring food with us, obviously. Uh, bringing seeds with us is not easy because you're not sure what the conditions are going to be on Mars in which to grow seeds. Okay, What you're going to do is you're going to bring the genetic information on your computer. And then based on the, condi based on the conditions of Mars, you're going to create new foods. So you may create, say, a lettuce that has a high protein composition and is able to grow in periods of four or five hours of sunlight as opposed to 12 hours. And those are gonna be entirely new, new, new foods. And, but think about it for a minute, you know, our great grandparents, 
If they walked into Whole Foods today, they wouldn't recognize any of the foods. They've all been modified, not through these very modern genetic techniques, but they've been uh, modified through specific breeding. <laughs> it is absolutely true. And I think it's just in some ways our our bio, biological brain has is not accelerating at the pace that our technologies are. And so I think that's where a lot of the fear is coming in is that we're just not keeping up to pace. And that, that I think is fundamentally what the issues are. So this is such an interesting thing, especially as we know that Elon Musk and others are preparing us for the next life on Mars. And so <laughs> this is not a sci-fi discussion. It's potentially a reality, who knows, in our lifetime or otherwise. But it is something to consider. And I think that the other core question ha has to do with the experience of life in this accelerated time and the, the joys of being human. So the joy, for example, that comes from savoring food, the taste, the tantalization, the way it, you know, the way certain chemicals interact with your tongue, the dopamine drip that comes from experiencing that in a social setting. Can this actually be created using virtual reality while at the same time perhaps being injected by chemicals to keep the to keep yourself fortified with the right macro and micronutrients? What do you see as being the reality of the food experience? So uh, obviously long term I can I have I have I have no idea. But but short term in the next 10 or 20 years as we develop these types that we, we, we develop these type, new types of foods, the consumer will demand certain things, okay? So when we, when we eat the hamburger patty made from cultured meat in, Cal in, in California, if we demand that it tastes very much like the current, current hamburger patties, that'll be done. That's not a, that won't be a problem. Uh, they can they can either add ingredients or they can genetically include ingredients in the cells making the meat. Okay, that give it one or the other uh, one or the other taste. So I, I don't see that as being a, a major issue. These technologies are are very adaptive. We we hear from a lot of books like Homo Deus and other things that you know world hunger is not really the major principal issue that it might have been one day and you know people are living a lot long, longer and Peter Diamandis is very hopeful that this is the best of times that we live in, but having said that there's still a large cohort of the world's population that um, hunger is still a reality or not getting optimal nutrients in their bodies. How can science really help to change the economic ecosystem so that people are you know are fortified are getting the right levels of food and so that they can accelerate their economies and move into next stages of where they need to be from a gdp standpoint what what can science do from a hunger management level well i if, if you look at the at the super meat or you look at culture cult, cultured meats uh that only not not only does that allow you to produce enough uh, enough stuff and enough protein for the entire earth okay but it solves quite a few of the climate change problems because cultured meat uses about 95 percent less land it uses 90 percent less water and probably around 90 to 95 percent less energy so if we can scale those technologies up to make sure that the costs are low okay you in fact can produce enough animal protein uh, to 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 feel it, feed those parts of the world that are that are craving it. Well, when we think about these things, we have to make sure we don't limit it to the three or four hundred million people of us who have uh, plenty to eat and plenty of, uh, plenty of protein and, and go to Whole Foods. There are additional seven billion people or so that don't have any of those luxuries. Yeah, absolutely. And so you bring up a really good point as we think about this food, food health are very interrelated with climate. And I was already alluding to earlier in our conversation about things are going crazy in mayhem, you know, the West Coast forest fires, the North Passageway and the melting of icebergs in, and, uh, you know, in the northern part in the Arctic and all kinds of ramifications about what this is looking like water levels rising, etc. 
So I guess ultimately the question also comes in is where, this is all kind of heralded with this idea around pollution. Um, the burning of fossil fuels. What does science have to say about managing some and curtailing some of these issues that we're seeing? So let, let, let's let's let, let's divide this into two. One, some of the solutions that I'm going to offer, and and the second being some of the political issues. Okay. So uh, one of the uh, most expensive financially and energy aspects of food production are fertilizers. They have to be mined, that's expensive. It's energetically expensive. Uh, there's a company in, in, in Boston who have developed a micro, adapted a microbe that will actually pick nitrogen out of the air and deposit directly onto plants. That has enormous implication in terms of, clim in, in terms of climate change, not having to mine and synthesize nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, there, we've known for many years that there are microbes that can actually sequester or eat mercury, lead, aluminum, uh, sulfur dioxide. They actually use those to, to energize themselves. So we can grow those microbes and be able to clean up some of our polluted lakes and rivers. And the Chinese have discovered a, 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 a very ancient microbe that is very effective in taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. It uses carbon dioxide. So the, the issue is, well, what, what, what does a microbe do with, it, with that carbon dioxide? So the issue, the, the possibility is that we can reuse that carbon dioxide either for additional fuels, so we don't have to mine fossil fuels, or we can use it in a manufacturing process building cement, building our highways. That's exciting because that will actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere and actually reverse global warming. So there are a ton of techniques there that are, that are available to us to solve some of the issues of climate change. The second issue is the more political issue is how we stop our addiction to fossil fuels. Now our governments and the, and the, and the Paris Accord talk about uh, decreasing our, our, our uh, uh, burning of fossil fuels by 50% by the year 2050. I believe that's Armageddon. That's much, much, much too slowly, okay? And we have to stop the fossil, burning of fossil fuels within the next decade. And it's not a problem because we have all the technology in terms of solar power, in terms of some of the small nuclear power plants that are being developed to replace the fossil fuels. And then it becomes an issue of the fossil fuel industry, the automotive and agricultural industry, the financial industry, and the politicians who have to have the will to do that. So we, there's not that much science to be done there. That's if, more an issue of, of leadership and, and politics and who have the vested interests in not making those conversions. Um, not wanting to make this a political discussion, but as we know, Biden is, uh, you know, the president elect is being inaugurated tomorrow. And we know that one of the first things that's going to be on his list is the, uh, the um, cancellation, if you will, of the Keystone XL pipeline and the impact potentially on Alberta and obviously the rest of the Canadian economy and lots of concerns about that. Do you think that's a good thing, a bad thing, or are you kind of happy you're seeing the silver lining of an opportunity that we, we can become uh, leaders, if you will, in clean tech? So it, 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 it's not a good thing, it's a superb thing. It's a necessary thing. I mean, our continued dependence on fossil fuels in Canada is madness, okay? And we should have been converting the Alberta economy, the Manitoba, Saskatchewan economy a decade ago. We should have been building nuclear power plants. We should have been building solar power plants and stopping our dependence on fossil fuels. Unfortunately, we have not had the political will to do that. So this is not a, this is not a political question. This, to me, this is an existential question. And, and it can be done. Sorry, it can be, it can be done. We did that in World War II. 
you know, we decided to, to, to transfer our, our entire economy to a war economy. You could not buy a dishwasher or a car in 1943, 44, because all of our efforts were going to, the, uh, to, to, to winning the war in Europe. And now what have we done with COVID-19? Well, you know, between Canada and the United States, we spent about $15 trillion, okay, to fight the pandemic and to shore people up. If we put that type of money into developing alternates for fossil fuels uh, and synthetic biology, we would, we, would, we would be in a much better position than we are now. Recently, the Canadian government made a decision not to sell a West Coast <coughs> mine to a foreign entity. Um, so there is some political, you know, understanding about how to protect resources and other sorts of things. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I'm just curious if you think that other thinking should be there about how we're mining and what we're mining in terms of climate management and staying on and, and being a leader scientifically as a country. Well, I mean, we, we, we do live as an individual country. Our wealth comes as an individual country. So we have to protect, we have to protect that wealth. And the wealth may be physical wealth, it may be mines, or it may be intellectual property. So we have we must protect protect those, but we also can't squander them. We can't say, well, they have to remain here, but keep them in the earth. We have to figure out a way to be able to to use them and market them and 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 sustain our ourselves as a wealthy country. And as we talk about political will, um, we, we I, I guess I just wanted to get your your view on um, this country in general about its its foresight and its thinking as we project and becoming a leader in something is when we look at some of the decisions that were made, for example, the situation that we're in right now with COVID-19 and being on the short end of the stick, if you will, and not having the right numbers of, you know, not having procured the right group. And so being behind, is this just the sign that you think of, of short leadership and the decision of, again, not going into clean tech earlier with some of these provinces that were relying on, on, on you know, basically dirty energy. Um, what advice would you give if you were speaking in front of a government official about how do we become more proactive? Uh, you're, you're striking home there. Uh, so the uh, Justin Trudeau's father, and I'm old enough to remember him, and a few uh, of his other cronies, <laughs> We're not strong believers in science because they thought that we could import all the science we needed uh, to survive as a country. And we would be basically be fine to be a country of hewers, hewers of wood and drawers of water. Well, I, you know, I think it's pretty clear that they were wrong. But there are still some vestiges of that in our society. And I think that's true if you look at our major banks and major finance, financial institutions and our dependence on fossil fuels and not on intellectual property. Now, the, the Christian governments, uh, less so the Harper governments and, and the current Trudeau government have been more positive about science, but they haven't been strong enough. Uh, there's a sort of terrific AI artificial intelligence investments that have been made in Quebec and Ontario. And I just heard that the Quebec investments have gone south to California. Uh, that's a terrible example. Uh, we have uh, uh, Trudeau and his folks decided to invest heavily in a COVID-19 vaccine, one in Saskatchewan and one in Quebec. It was pretty clear at the time that they weren't gonna go anywhere. And we put $400 million into that. We, we have to be smarter than that, but we have to compete with the Americans and we can, you know, we compete with them in mining industries. Why can't we keep compete with them in biotechnology? What do you feel is going to be the future of science collaboration and discovery when we're kind of in a push pull situation between regionalization and nationalism and the pull for globalization? How are we going to progress as a world collaboration in that kind of environment and milieu? So that's too complicated a question for me. <laughs> really, I mean, I, you know, I, I think we can con continue as we are, where we have collaboration, where we have intellectual property ownership, uh, and 
I think as, as long as we're as long as we're we're a world of individual nations, each of them who have a vested interests in their own populations, we're going to have to develop arrangements of, of collaboration. But we're all going to have to uh, believe in our own, uh, you know, believe in our own entities and our our own interests. And that's a good example of, uh, of what's gone wrong with the COVID-19 vaccine. Why are we 10th or 12th in the world in terms of our vaccination rates uh, and compared to uh, many other countries, including China, including Israel, including, including the United States? That's not acceptable. That's that's occurred because we were we were we were provincial and didn't understand our own capabilities. We have a lot of people these days, um, you know, especially some of the very, uh, you know, very lucky in the world or the top elite uh, wealth billionaires like the Elon Musks and, and the Jeff Bezos and others who are investing very heavily in longevity. Um, what does it mean to become a cyborg? You know, again, with Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink and other sorts of inve inventions. Uh, even people like David Sinclair, I'm sure you've heard of him on um, on longevity and sort of the work that he's done on, on, with uh, sirtuins and yeast and what have you. Lots and lots of work going on with longevity. Is what do you predict as being the future of of being humanness? Is is there a world where we're going to you know we're going to solve a lot of these issues and be able to live till we're 150? What is your prediction of that? You know, there is a, a process called apoptosis. It's A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S. -P -P -S. And it's it's natural cell death. Okay. And uh, I I don't think that we're programmed as humans and our cells are programmed to uh, to, to to live for to live forever. Number one. Number two, uh, who would want to do that unless we continue to live as as 30 year olds. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're, they're interesting initiatives. And of course, they, some really interesting science comes out of them. But, uh, you know, I don't spend too much time uh, taking them too seriously. But some of the work that, that, that David St. Clair talks about is very interesting. Live longer, healthier. Uh, why not? Is there a reality in your opinion that we will if we won't live forever, will there be a reality where we will be living on Mars? You know, I guess if things got bad enough here on Earth, uh, some small group might uh, might get to Mars and figure out how to live there. But the stark reality is that the conditions on Mars are not uh, are not acceptable in terms of human 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 life, and so we have to create our own atmosphere there. And you know that's a pretty dire thing to have to do. And I would much rather us live well uh, here on Earth and solve some of the problems, many of which can be solved from <laughs> saved by science. I was watching the Terminator the other day, and it sort of occurred to me as this very, uh, very uh, existential idea of maybe one day things are going to be so bad that one day we may look at the past and say, one, at one point we used to go outside, but everything will be in an immersive experience in a virtual world. And if we ever get to that place, it wouldn't make any difference if we lived on, on Earth or on Mars. So we'll see what, what that looks like in the future. But talking about your book, Saved by Science, what's next for you with the blog, with the book? How can people find you and, and what are you doing with this information? Well, my, my book is uh, Saved by Science. The, uh, yes, can you see that? We can, yes. Uh, it's not backwards? No, I can see it okay. perfectly. So Saved by Science, The Hope and Promise of Synthetic Biology. That uh, was published uh, late last year. Uh, I blog every week on my website, which is www.savedbyscienceoneword.org. Uh, I'm just in the process of uh, completing a book on, on climate change. Uh, and it talks about the, the origins of climate change, the, 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 the issues that we have and the solutions, some of which I've talked about now. Uh, it has a tentative title, 
called The Giving Tree from Shel Silverstein's book, A Metaphor for Climate Change. And it's a story of a boy in a tree and fossil fuels and stuff like that. So it's exciting. And then the book that I'm just collecting material on now is uh, called Evidence Matters. And it comes to the very early questions that, that you asked me. And uh, how do we make sure that uh, we create a, a, an atmosphere, a population uh, that both understands and trusts science? And I think you can do it without having a PhD in science. Uh, and that's basically what I'm trying to do. And I wanted to attest, I have uh, read your book, Mark, and I wanted to uh, mention if anybody has a chance to pick up the book, it's a fascinating read, but it's really simple. You've done a fantastic job of taking really complex concepts and making it super digestible and super easy to understand. So highly recommend uh, to those of you listening, pick up the book, Saved by Science. Uh, it's a fantastic read. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this afterwards, we're going to be leaving links to access Mark uh, in the show notes once this is available in one to two weeks with the recording. So please reach out to him if you have questions, if you want to partner, or if you're looking for a speaker, um, he does all of those things. And we also encourage you to connect with us at impetusdigital.com. Uh, impetus if you're interested in these kinds of discussions, these really provocative, big, hairy discussions beyond the pill conversations, working out some of these big, complex, comp uh, you know, complicated issues in the world, we can bring your stakeholders together in these asynchronous and synchronous virtual touch points, one after the other, so you can solve and gather insights and to create consensus on, on really, really difficult topics. So, um, I, and uh, we would really love to see you. If you like this video, we would encourage you to like it and subscribe to our channel so other people can also find this. We appreciated everybody for your time today. Mark, it was absolutely fascinating topic. Thank you for being with us and wishing everybody a wonderful day ahead. Stay healthy. <laughs>